about the person you come on the other side of writing a book. What sort of book it is? It can be a business book, it can be a memoir, it can be anything. It can be a children's book. The process of writing will change your life. Hello everyone and welcome back. This is Tony Lontis, your host of the Artist and Author Hour. We have another amazing female author to talk to you about this evening. But before we do, just a reminder, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch or Twitter, please don't forget to like, subscribe and comment. You can find the replays of all of our shows on Binge Networks USA or via the Tony TV channel app available on Roku, LG and Samsung. We love to hear from you, so please reach out and let us know your thoughts. And don't forget that all the information we talk about, including the way to connect to our amazing guest, appears in the show notes below this show. We encourage you to reach out and connect with our guest. They are a special part of the Tony TV team. Now, each and every week, we do something that is important, uh, an important acknowledgement of the special part that our Indigenous communities have played in the development of this country's cultural identity. So today, I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region, on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and broadcast. And I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here watching and listening today. Now, the title of our interview today is called Embodying Soul, A Return to Wholeness. And our beautiful guest is a wonderful woman called Kerry Mangus. Now, here's what you need to know about Kerry before I introduce you to her. Kerry has studied and taught yoga, Abhavida, herbal medicine, energy work, aromatherapy, Buddhism, Hinduism, Tantra, Christianity, and other spiritual teachings and healing modalities. Today, she is an author, speaker, and owner of Curiosa Publishing LLC and is a monthly columnist in the Edge magazine. And a big shout out to Kelly and the team at the Edge magazine who do such an amazing job of promoting and talk about talking about spirituality, consciousness, and alternate ways of healing. Uh, Kerry also writes uh, on the topic of personal transformation, a subject close to her heart. She writes regularly for Spirituality and Health Online and has had her work featured in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, The Elephant Journal, Addicted to Success, and many, many others. Kerry tries not to wear too many labels for too long, but rather sees herself as trying them on for size. She is, however, she has, however, been called a cultural provocateur, a hooligan, a mind-bendingly badass and a deep thought translator. She loves these labels and they are just fine with her. As a human being, she seeks to live an authentic life as much as she possibly can. As a seeker, she longs to dig deeper into the meanings of everyday life. As a writer, she can merge her humanity with spirituality to present insights that help in everyday life and speak to one's soul. Her memoir of New Beginnings won several awards, including the 2020 IPA Award for Mind, Body, Spirit, Embodying Soul, A Return to Wholeness, is her current book. Kerry, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. I thought that today we would start the show with one of your favourite quotes, and it is by Rumi, and it's, work in the invisible world at least as hard as you do in the visible. Kerry, what does this quote mean Mm. to you? 
Oh, it, it, it means everything to me. This is all about becoming, beca- turning inward, becoming reflective, mm. being able to see ourselves clearly and getting to know ourselves clearly. Mm. A lot of times we live in this world and we don't really know who we are because we've just kind of become um, piecemeal of all the things that have worked for us in the past or have been approved by family and loved ones. And so we're out into the world and it's almost like a masquerade. Mm -hmm. And as long as we just keep focusing outward, there's no chance to see if that's actually working for us, if it's even who we are. Mm -hmm. So working in that inner world is about doing the work of reflection and healing and shadow work which is very powerful, which I'm writing about right now and very hard, but very rewarding as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no better place to educate yourself, to challenge yourself, to self-reflect is in that inner world, because that will be what shines through in the outer world. And yeah, it's hard work though, Kerry, isn't it? Well, it can it can kind of take us by surprise because mm-hmm. sometimes I think we think that doing this work is going to be all light and love and ease and peace, mm. but there's a lot of mud down there mm. too. And there's a lot that we've hidden away from ourselves and there is really no way of knowing what we might uncover. So spiritual work is actually fairly, it's, it's brave work. It's yes. courageous. Yes. But, but as you fulfilling. said, so rewarding. Mm. Definitely. Kerry, if you knew when you were growing up, um, how would you have described yourself? Oh, so talking about how we present ourselves in a mm. world in a way that other people approve of. Mm. Um, I was a very quiet, shy girl. I'm still very introverted. But I wouldn't also say that I'm quiet and shy. I'm outspoken as I need to be. I enjoy being around people. I just know that I need to retreat at some time and regain my energy. Uh, but I when to... I was a kid, yes, go ahead. It's Sorry, I, I, that retreating and reg- <laughs> regaining your perspective is so important for a lot of people, isn't it? It is. And I think that especially... For those of us who give a lot in the outer world, we need that even more. The more you work out in the outer world, the more you need that inner time. It's like that, um, have you ever heard that parable where the man um, goes to a sage and he says, you know, uh, what do I need? And the sage says, you need meditation. Mm -hmm. And he says, just do five minutes a day. And the man says, I don't have five minutes a day. I'm so busy. He said, well, if you're that busy, in that case, double it, you know, and, it, and it's on that line, right? So the busier we are, the more active we are in the outer world, the more we need that retreating in that inner life. I so agree with you, Kerry. And and that's simply, I'm an introvert as well. And, and I need loads of downtime um, and away time and grounding time um, and I can do lots during the week but on the weekend it's like time out uh, no socials no responding to emails otherwise I can't do what I need to do during the week do you find that too Kerry? Yes. Yeah absolutely I find that and that what you're talking about is that that I feel the word that came to mind is cocoon yes I put myself yes, yes. back in the cocoon, in a cocoon. <laughs> yes yes And I'm very reluctant to let anyone or anything into that space because I know what I need for the week going forward, um, which not a lot of people understand, I find. Do you find that too, Kerry? It's possible that people can get very confused about that need. But here's the truth. If we continue to live from, um, if we continue to put out energy, and then eventually we're drawing off of our reserves because we're not refueling, then what we're giving out is going to be less and less pure, less and less authentic. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get bitter and we're going to get resentful. 
resentful exactly of doing the work and of the people that we're giving it to. So in the end, it's better for everybody. And that's, I think what we all need to learn as a society is we all do better. I struggled we... with that as a people pleaser. I struggle with that, Kerry. Like I, yes. it's only in the last 12 months that I've um, looked at my calendar and gone, no, between this time and this time, that's my time out. I don't do this and I don't work before this time and I don't work after this time. And often people will challenge you and go, but you're not available. Well, actually, I am. Um, I need to be. Uh, and Kerry, I remember listening just recently to Brene Brown, and she was. It was a, a replay of her workshop um, in um, Rising um, Bravely, and she talks about that um, needing to put ourselves first and the struggle it was for her, and she frames it in a way that. If we don't look after ourselves, we can't be our best selves and we can't be our best selves for those people that we want to give to. Yeah. Oh, and you're talking about self-love. Yeah. And, you know, when we're that people pleaser that you were talking about, yeah. we we are actually in a place of lacking uh, that full self-love that understands that in order for me to give myself fully to you, yeah. I first need to give to myself. You need to fill myself. I, when I think about, you know, after I wrote my memoir, you spend a mm, lot of time yeah. asking like, what is it really about? What's, mm. what is the main theme? And I always came up with a few and they were, you know, some of them were a little fancy, but I ended up boiling it down to my memoir is about my journey to self-love. Yeah. And I didn't know that until after the book was written, but yes. that's what happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you, in that book, you talk about your soul um, and you actually give her a name, um, Serene Voyager. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that, Carrie? Oh, yes. So I like to think about my life from the perspective of my soul, this part of myself that came down into this world that incarnated here for a specific reason and had certain dreams and goals in mind for herself. And we get, we kind of get separated from this idea of ourselves as soul. We, we start to identify more with ourselves as ego. That's part of the human or personality. Journey. Yeah. Yeah. And our personality and yeah. our job titles and yeah. so on. Um, but when I was writing the memoir and I was in this place of, of healing a lot of these things, I thought this experience was really painful for me. How would it look through the eyes of my soul? And so what I did is I created this whole world and this whole storyline of my soul mm. that parallels my own journey. And you see how she was looking at for example, uh, you know, my approach to the world as being a very ambitious person, for instance, yes. and what I was going to have to learn what that ambition was going to teach me because ambition, we think as our egos, that is a very strong and healthy trait to have. Uh -huh. But what I've learned is that ambition can be poisonous. Mm -hmm. When we don't understand it, and when we yeah. don't know how to temper it. Mm -hmm. And I learned these things as I was writing these scenes from the perspective of my soul. Yeah. And it didn't make sense to write a book that just said, my soul would look at it this way. So I just gave her a name. A name. And of course, the name came to me. That's yes. how that works. Yes. And Serene is about her... Her primary energy is serene. She can see things with equanimity, mm. um, with such an ease, whether or not it's pain or pleasure, she's just serene. Mm. And then the Voyager, of course, is because of her love it's a of traveling. Journey. Yeah. Yeah. And the journey. And so uh, she lives in the soul realm. My story is told in the earth realm. They can, they eventually converge in the book. Which is what and they're meant to do though, isn't it? We're meant to have a convergence of, of, of soul and our physical body. Um, and, yes. and it's our soul that should be driving our journey on this earth. Yeah. And I see it as a partnership too, because mm -hmm. one of the things I learned in my yoga journey was, well, and I think a lot of us have learned this, mm -hmm. um, this message that our ego is bad, that our ego is wrong, that our ego is all of these things. Yeah. 
I don't, uh, I don't, I don't subscribe to that message. I think I that ego just has an important that part. partnership. It's a component mm -hmm. of who you yes. are and it's how yes. you, you look at things and it can, and I agree, I, I'm not sure that it's either good or bad. It's just there. Yeah. It's how we express, you know, ourselves in the world. I, one of the things that I really enjoyed writing in the book was how serene Voyager, how excited she was mm -hmm. to take on a personality and mm -hmm. to take on this particularly, this particular journey. And I was born in, you know, the, Midwest of the United States yes. and oh boy why my soul was so excited about that yeah and couldn't wait to to meet my parents and mm. you know it was it was so different looking at my life through her eyes yeah. it gave me such grace and forgiveness yes. and and, and healing? just peace so yeah. much healing can you tell and us a so little bit about that yes um can we can can you tell us a little bit about that healing and forgiveness journey? So much of what we learn when we write down our stories, which is why I think you don't have to be a memorist, Correct. but for anybody listening right now, write your stories. Yes. There's so much value in just On writing so many things levels. down. So many. And we just, well, you might not always see the meaning in it right away, but as you start to look back, you start tracing things back. And what you find out is that a lot of our stuff, let's call it stuff, originated in childhood somehow. And that's not about blame. No, that's it's not about, not about guilt. blame. It, it's not about blame. It's about learning and healing and being better. Learning and healing and understanding and saying, well, this makes sense because mm. I was taught this mm. and you know and it's not working for me anymore no wonder this mm. is happening and that's mm. happening and I feel stressed and I feel polarized and I think when I talk about the healing that happened in the book I think it was primarily through my family line both backwards and forwards yeah so I healed backwards my parents and my grandparents and yeah. and what their struggles were and their mm -hmm. weaknesses and their strengths mm -hmm. and then I wrote a lot about parenting and my two daughters and I healed forward as yes. well so important so important mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can do the healing work from a retrospective but that healing forward is a powerful thing and a powerful thing for all the generations that will follow you, Gary. So many things that I said, this habit ends here. Yeah. And it's something that's been carried down. So one of these things I'm talking about is the trait of endurance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My, I come from a family line of Norwegians and Swedish, <gasps> um, you know, Scandinavian. <laughs> oh my goodness. I've just found out. I. I just found out that I've got this whole lineage of Danish and German heritage. Oh. So when you said that, I've got goosebumps up and down my arms, Gary. We're all connected. You know? Yes. yes. Um, and there's there's a real stoicism in this yes. family line. And yes. my, my relatives going back were farmers and hard yes. workers. And there's this stoicism and then there's this endurance. And my mom's motto was always, uh, you you can you can cry or get angry later, but right now you have to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So it was always about getting through, getting through, mm -hmm. getting through. Mm -hmm. And and for the record, I never did see my mom cry or get angry later. Yeah, you know. So yeah. she would say that's for later, but she never did go back. And so when I say certain traits that end here, mm -hmm. it's the stoicism. It's yeah. that endurance at all costs. Yeah. That yes, there are a lot of things that I learned from my mom in being able to endure things. Yes. But I'm not going to lose that. Just no, because you're just going to look seen, at it in a different and more yes. healthy way. Yes. If that makes sense. It absolutely does, and that, and so now when I look at my daughters and their approach to life, I see something that approaches more balance with that particular trait. Amazing, amazing. Yep. Kerry, you talk about um, an embodied soul. Can you walk the audi audience through what that mm. an embodied soul means to you? 
Mm. So I think a lot of times when we think of being incarnated, mm. we think of it as a as a verb that's done once. Mm. We incarnated and that's our birthday. Yeah. But incarnation is a process mm -hmm. and a journey. Mm -hmm. And embodiment and incarnating these two words they're about holding more and more of who we are mm -hmm. and that goes back to our earlier conversation about the shadow and the light yeah what makes us comfortable what makes us a little uncomfortable but mm -hmm. still is part of who we are mm -hmm. it's about embodiment of the whole spectrum of our humanity that is what an embodied soul is it's not about being always blissed out yes <laughs> or it, it's not it's the very opposite of enlightenment enlightenment yeah. is up and out right and enlightenment mm. yeah and and we need that on the planet and yes. there are people yes. whose journeys are all oh, about what Definitely. they provide on this earth can't be quantified mm. but there are the rest of us i think most of us are called mm. to embody to mm -hmm. get inside our bodies, to get on this planet mm -hmm. and be connected with each other, mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at a very intimate level to practice empathy and compassion. You can't do that if you're up and out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know that my journey was originally about a desire to get up and out, away mm -hmm. from the pain, mm -hmm. away from the disillusionment and the disappointments yeah and now we're we're coming yes. we're down you know Kerry you talk about the dark night of the soul and when I hear that phrase and I, I've heard it lots over the course of course of my life and it's meant different things to different people um for you what was that dark night of the soul what did it look like Oh, that's such good timing for you to ask that mm. question because it's exactly what I was just saying about those moments mm. that hit you, that you feel like you're a disappointment mm. to everybody. You feel like the world has lied to you because mm. all the mottos and motifs that, that you were told about, you know, work hard and the winners will always come to the surface. Correct. It's not apparent in your life. Yes. And here I am, you know, I was... 30 years old, I had a business degree I wasn't using, I had depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and I was overcome mm -hmm. with, uh, with just the sense of loss of connection with who I am and what my purpose is. Mm -hmm. A dark night of the soul is that complete disconnection. If embodiment is a complete connection, the dark night of the soul is the opposite. Disconnection. And do you think that everyone, for the most part, will experience that dark night of the soul at some stage in their life, Carrie? Let's hope so. Yeah. Because here's the <laughs> thing. These dark nights are where we go searching, mm -hmm. where we start dissembling. Something changes because it can't get any worse. No, that's right. I mean, as long as things are trucking along just mm -hmm. fine, then why would we stop? We're not pause? challenged, are we? We're not challenged mm -hmm. when things are going well. We're challenged no. in that dark night of the soul, aren't we? Yes, yes. And we, and also, we always emerge stronger, wiser, yes, and more whole. Yes, and there, there is such beauty in that, and more humble. Yes. I will say that my dark nights, I, I, I kind of count three that I've yeah. had that are big. Yeah, yeah. Each one, and by humble, I don't mean that um, I just got really quiet and small, kind of the opposite. Yeah. That humility allows you to just settle in who you are mm. a lot more comfortably. So you don't feel you have to go telling everybody this or everybody that. You just... Mm. You come into yourself into and just you're you're at peace with yourself. You're at home yes. in yes. yourself. Yes. That's what humility means to me. Yes, definitely. Um, Carrie, in the book, you talk a lot about emotions and um, you write about emotions speaking loudest. Um, for you in your book, what emotions took prominence? for you 
So, and I will tell you that my emotions really do speak in the book. I give them lines <laughs> yes, of dialogue. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, and and that that was really fun to write as well. To yes. I mean, if I was going to bring the soul to life, I decided to bring the emotions to life as yes. well. And my favorite emotion in the book and in life mm-hmm. is anger. I have a real soft spot towards my anger. Um, and I have come to know how to speak with it, mm. how to dance with it, mm-hmm. how to move with it, mm-hmm. how to align with it. I used to be someone again, with my stoic background, mm-hmm. that if I did get angry or irritated, it all went push inward. down, push it down, push it down. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. But then when you until it came out point, sideways, <laughs> I was just going to say, and then it's like a volcano and it just explodes and goes where it was never meant to go. But that's because you've been pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. Don't get angry. Um, but it's got to come out. And, and and it does. Kerry, you speak mm-hmm. about how you walk with that. You talk about mm-hmm. how to transform it. So can you share just a little bit of that with the audience? Oh, yes, I would love to. I, I find that you can transform that anger from something that it kind of scares you mm-hmm. and comes out in inopportune moments and in ways that you don't, that you regret. That are not helpful. <laughs> Let's that aren't that. helpful or healthy or yes. kind, right? Yes. Conversing with it. Yeah. Actually sitting down. What's so this going is the exercise here? I do. <laughs> you sit down, you mm-hmm. put another pillow across from you and you imagine your anger sitting there. Mm-hmm. What does it look like? What does it smell like? And then you say, all right, what's on your mind? And then you switch spots. Yeah. And so now you go and you embody the anger and you speak in anger's voice and you say, this is what's really bothering me right now. I really, you know, and then you switch spots again. And I've done this exercise. I read it in a book once and I've done yeah. it numerous times yeah. where you just switch spots and you yeah. create this dialogue. It never fails that you walk away from this dialogue, this play with tears running down your face. And a deeper a sense of. Mm, so much and more compassion for yourself and does it dispel the anger that you might have been feeling in that moment and and help it go in a different way if the anger wasn't healthy it Mm. might dispel but if it's a righteous anger oh god let's that, talk that's about coming, righteous anger go right on. and if it's coming well if it's coming from a real place of having been justice then, then what this dialogue will help you do is channel it mm. so that you don't hurt people. Yeah. And that's why I think activism mm. and spiritual spirituality need to come together because spirituality yeah. has that, that, that ability to relate to oneself. Activism has that, what needs Drive to be done in the sense forward. of injustice. Yes. Yes. Bring them together then we can do activism in a way that is Mm. heart-centered and we can fuel that anger as passion. Absolutely. Um, uh, The term righteous anger is is a relatively new thought for me um, because you might have guessed that I've struggled with anger throughout my life at different points, but I'm the one who's who suppresses it until it's got nowhere else to go but sideways or wherever. Um, The understanding that in certain times righteous anger is absolutely the right response Um, and knowing and understanding how to direct that righteous anger is an important part of our soul's journey and learning, don't you think, Kerry? I do. And I think women especially have been shamed out of their anger. Correct. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed as a woman to be angry with the cards that you've been dealt. Right. Right. But if we don't have that, anger is also about urgency. It's Mm. also about this has to happen now. Mm. And if your child were standing on the edge of a cliff and Mm. about to take one more step, 
Mm. Saying kindly step back from the ledge might not be the best tactic. You say back up now. Now, like you sometimes anger is about safety, about yeah. protection, yes, about holding uh, onto what matters to us, about about protecting our space, about self love. Anger yes. can be an expression of self love. Ah. Not, and we are, we are, yes, we are. And we are not at all um, in a place where we're, we're really ready to take that on. No, right. As a culture. That's a, yeah. That, that's a, another powerful conversation. Cause I don't, I don't believe we are quite at that point, Kerry. No, but we will. I think yeah. more and more women are having conversations. There's some really great books out there. Oh. Um, I think there's one called rage becomes her, mm-hmm. which is, Absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic and so highly recommended. Yes. Um, Rebecca Solnit, um, yes. she either wrote that one or another one. But there are authors out there and books on there about women's anger mm. and why we need it. Because, again, generationally, we've been taught or told that our anger is not okay. And our anger in righteous anger is absolutely okay. It's how we deal with it, how we direct it, and how we help it achieve an outcome that is positive for humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And anger is ultimately, uh, this is another way to look at it too. Anger Mm -hmm. is an emotion of fire. Yes. And when you think about the element of fire, Mm -hmm. what does it do in the world? It illuminates. Yes. It brings, brings light. light. Yes. Or it, it um it, it burns what the trash, burns what is bad, you know? It leads the way. It yeah. it gets rid of um you know the stuff that builds up. It fire is so mm. powerful. Mm. And so why would we want to live our lives without an emotion of fire? Mm. You know? Mm. And only only be able to be water, right? Women are only allowed to be soft and sad and yeah. kind and sweet and gentle. Those are and all water so emotions. So many other things as well that are equally important yeah. and equally valuable in our human experience, aren't they? Yes, very much so. I want to talk briefly, Kerry, about life's purpose. And finding life's purpose. And again, that's a whole other subject. But um, can you talk us through your thoughts on finding life's purpose? So a while back in our conversation, when I was talking about the soul coming down, Mm -hmm. you might have heard me say, we come down here for a reason. But what I don't say is we come down here for a purpose. Yes. I actually think that there's a slight distinction. Uh-huh. Now, here's what it is for me. A reason is we're here for transformation. We're here for healing. We're here for connection. We're here for mm-hmm. growth. Mm-hmm. We're here for experiences. Mm-hmm. Purpose, when people think, what's your purpose? What do they generally think of? Job titles. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Right. They think about labels. They think about, you know, I'm supposed to be this or that yes. or this or that. And it's not so much the the growing, the doing, the experiencing. Mm-hmm. It's I'm here to be a nurse. I'm here to be a caretaker. I'm here to be a so there's something about the word purpose mm-hmm. that to me feels very harsh and um <clears throat> uh too expectant too um putting too many labels on it and too much pressure Mm. and i mean how many you and i right now we could google yes you know workshops on purpose and there's just gonna be and a lot of pressure so much pressure Mm. and people feel the the clock ticking i haven't found my purpose i haven't found my purpose and what i want to say is let that go Mm. instead let your journey be about the exploration the trying on and the trying off of yeah. these labels Which is and what roles you've done Kerry is try different things on and it's yes. actually okay isn't it it well I didn't think so for a long no, time I, I was I one of those people so either I, I would have 
agreed with you and thought, well, this is my life's purpose, but actually the purpose of my life or, or the direction or the journey of my life might be yes. multiple different things along that yes. course of that journey. Absolutely. And if we get too caught up, let's say we do think we found our life purpose. So there's, there's one issue where we never find it. Then let's just say that we found it when we were, you know, young, then what happens when that shifts or changes or what happens yeah. if we start to feel discontent? We don't, feel okay about leaving because we have said but this is my purpose mm -hmm. and so we've tied ourselves to it in such a way to a singular that... a singular idea versus a journey of yes. ideas or a journey yes. of purposes yes. in one instance we're trying to find a costume and wear it forever in mm. the other we remember that life is always about the masquerade and it's, and it's always about Mm -hmm. And that's why I always struggle with the labels. That's why I have yeah. a hard time deciding what to call myself because yes. today I felt, I feel a little bit like this, but you know, I don't know. I, t tomorrow I might not. Absolutely. I, I just, I think that's a very freeing um, concept to think about where you fit in life. Um, I, I know myself, I was a nurse for for 35 years and now I'm in non-traditional media completely yes. opposite <laughs> but I'm actually getting more and more okay with that and then well, in gonna this say, time it might be something else you know it might and you know it'd be interesting sometime I would love to chat with you about mm. what I bet you you went through some difficulty in your oh, thought process about leaving yeah. the world of nursing yes Yes, yeah. yes. And I was challenged on it as well because, you know, people said to me, oh, you spent 35 years doing this. Why would you walk away from your your license and your registration to do something completely different? And I was challenged on that. But yeah. as I stepped more into letting go of what other people thought and more into, well, I'm being directed. There's some synchronicity and there's some some things happening that keep drawing me to that space. So let's just go and explore that. And it's really scary, isn't it? Those leaps of faith are mm. so scary, but so I always think about it like we we have to be willing to take the step, not knowing that there will be something underneath Correct. us. Yes. Yes, then you might be free falling for a while. Um, and, yes. and you may be free falling for a long while. Well, and we might be nothing yeah. for a little while. Yeah. And I've been not I've been nothing a few mm -hmm. periods of time in my life. And uh, I was lucky to have people around me that understood a lot of this and were able to help me understand that this is an opportunity, the time of being nothing is a very sweet opportunity to get mm. to explore anything yeah. because I'm unencumbered. I'm free. Yeah. And you know, then yes, the labels start to come again, yeah. but each time you take them off and put them back on, they become less sticky. Yeah. You start to see them more as the, the fun that they are versus the mm. obligation. Mm. Everything starts to shift in relationship to these roles and even personality characteristics yeah. and, yeah. you know, yeah. things we get stuck in there too. Yeah. Kerry, the other thing um, that you've been writing and talking about um, recently is alchemy. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Tell us about what that mm -hmm. means. Well, here's the thing. We've been talking about it this whole time. Yeah. Yeah. We have, because alchemy is ultimately the process of I breaking the word. things down. <laughs> oh, me too. Me mm. too. It's the process of breaking things down in the fire, yes. right? Using fire to break things down and then remixing it in mm. a new and different way. Mm. I mean, when, when a lot of people think of alchemy, maybe they're thinking about, you know, turning lead into gold. Mm. But what happens when we decide we're going to turn what's leaded in us, mm. you know, the things, the parts of ourselves that have become heavy yes. and valueless yes. into gold? Mm. And that's life lessons and wisdom. Yeah. And so that's the alchemical journey of human consciousness. 
is mm-hmm. to be able to put ourselves through this alchemical process of transformation. And yes, it makes sense that I've been writing and studying about that lately because it so fits with what my experience in life has been. Mm. The other thing is too, when I was reading um, some of the things that you had been writing and speaking about in terms of alchemy, it occurred to me it felt like a very feminine process. Um, Mm. The the image or the vision that, that came to me was that of ancient work of um, women combining herbs and and ritual in the alchemy of uh, everyday life um, and I thought I must remember to share that with, with you when I was when I was thinking about the word alchemy and thinking about your work and and uh, alchemy in general it felt to me like a a, a rebirthing of something very feminine and beautiful does it strike you that way as well? And and that's not to discount the masculine in that process, but in this, this conversation, it, it felt very feminine. Yes, in the sense that our culture generally moves in a linear, forward, and what we would say masculine pattern, mm-hmm. alchemy is more circular. Yeah. And it is about the deaths and the rebirths. And like a so, mixing yes. pot almost. Yes and an acceptance and a surrender and a falling apart. I've written some articles lately about the value of falling apart. And that is another concept that is very against the grain because our culture says, here's how to pick yourself up Mm. if you're falling apart. And I'm saying, and this is going to be the topic of my next book, here's how to fall apart better. Here's how to go all the way into the falling apart so that you can really uh, reap the benefits Mm. that come Mm. when you let yourself become nothing, when you let yourself completely surrender to that process. Yeah. And that is, we would also call that a yin process uh, from the Buddhist Taoism, the yin and the yang. And it's, and it's, also a dark process because and here we come again to the dark night of the soul see it's all connected Mm, you know mm. we use different terms from different traditions yes but they all speak of the same thing they do don't they it's just a different it's a different terminology for something (laughs) that's similar or same um yeah carrie i'm conscious of of our time and there's some other things that i really want to discuss and one of those things is is particularly pertinent in today's world and that feeling of chaos that is currently enveloping the world and from my perspective and again I I say this often it's actually I feel like this generation and particularly this generation of women are ushering in a new era and with the usherance of a new era comes some chaos but I want you Kerry, to explore that from from your perspective about the current chaos around the world. There is a lot, isn't there? There is. We are living in a very different time. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that we all need to do is take a moment and give ourselves some grace Mm -hmm. because we are taking in and experiencing more chaos around us than I think Mm -hmm. previous generations have had to. And so for people out there that feel like maybe it's just too much. Uh, it's a lot. We're here. It's here. And mm. and at the same time, there is a great gift in getting to be alive at a time like this. Oh, because a, a privilege, isn't it? A privilege. It is. Because what chaos does, chaos is what we get when we burn down the traditional orders mm-hmm. of things. Chaos mm-hmm. is the opposite of the status quo. Mm. And I, for one, am not in favor of the status quo. Mm. So sometimes things need to go into chaos or crisis mm-hmm. where they get melted down in that alchemical. Mashed up. <laughs> yeah. Twisted around, that stirred pot. up. That's mm-hmm. right. And, and then we can reevaluate and build something new. I think yes. a lot of times we feel ourselves falling into these places of crisis and we want to just fix it and get it back up and just you know use popsicle sticks whatever we have to do to hold it Uh, I think as a culture we're going to be asked to find the courage 
to let things actually go because we cannot fix the system of this world that we can't fix and neither should they be fixed that's some of the that's some of the ideology that I've been reading about lately that some of these things should not be fixed they should be burned down destroyed absolutely start again from a different perspective well, and can I just say, I'm, I'm from the United States where we have such an incredible mm. problem with guns and policing. Yeah. And um, there's so many things we could say here, but for one of, an example of what you're talking mm. about, the policing system yeah. needs to simply be burned down yes. and begun anew. Yes. It's not about them being bad or wrong. or it, no, It's I, not about all of that. It's just it's about not a system. working. It's a system that is just mm. needs change. Yes. So I would, you know, we, we all need to learn how to embrace that chaos a little mm. bit more, let ourselves be part of it mm. um, and see what happens, see what we can yes. create what comes, anew. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's also a powerful point to remember that out of chaos, good things grow out of chaos, disruption, changes happen. And I think, for people that might be listening today and struggling with the amount of stress and chaos in the world is to take that positive thought that out of this could come a way, well, I believe absolutely without a doubt that there will be a way better world, humanity, people once we get to the other side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and But we have to go through to get out. You have to walk through it. There's no way around it. There's no way mm-hmm. to avoid it. It's walking through it. And part of that is walking through it together. And it's having conversations like you and I are having today. Um, yes. And it's about walking through it, but but knowing that there are other people around you to support you and help you. Um, I know that Kerry's one of those people. Kerry, um, before we run out of time, you're working on another book. Can you tell us quickly what that's about? It is about how it's called in times of crisis. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> it is. And it is about how we um, are learning how to move through the crisis of our world by understanding how we move through them personally. It's mm-hmm. about letting ourselves fall apart and go through these stages. Yeah. And in this book, I'll carry the readers through the stages of alchemy to get to that rebirth. I can't wait. Carrie, <laughs> when did it be finished? No, no idea, because it's in chaos right now. <laughs> Which is perfectly understandable and fine exactly. as well. Carrie exactly. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and the audience today. Um, I know that we will have further conversations and I can't wait to get you back um, when you get the next book out. But that, my friends, is your lot for this week. Please thank Kerry Mangus for joining us on the Artist and Author Hour. I'm your host, Tony Lonis. We will be back next week with another guest on another show. And thank you for joining us. what sort of book it is it can be a business book it can be a memoir it can be anything it can be a children's book the process of writing will change your life